Okay, let's begin. It's still not showing the recording yet, though. Okay, yes, now it's showing. Okay, great. All right. Um, a very good evening from India uh, to everyone joining us from around the world. Uh, my name is Abhinandan, and uh, I am at the DST Center for Policy Research at the Indian Institute of Science. I am pleased to welcome you all to this event. Uh, my oh, brief okay. here is to say a few words about the event itself, and uh, uh, here we go. Uh, it all started with uh, Professor Subaya Arunachalam joining our center as a visiting professor in uh, 2015. While the bulk of his work at our center was on uh, scientometrics, he educated us in his own quiet but persuasive way uh, to look at uh, broader cultural norms in higher education, especially the norms are related to publication practices. And it was this education that uh, gave us the nudge uh, to hold our first event during the Open Access Week in 2017. Uh, therefore, this year's event is the fifth in our series. And over the years, uh, we have featured uh, quite a few OA scholars and activists, including Professor Vijay Raghavan, who is uh, leading India's initiative in Open Access, uh, as well as uh, Mr. Carl Malamud, who is now in the news for all the wonderfully right reasons. Um, by a happy coincidence, this year's event is happening just around a month after our mentor and guru, Professor Arunachalam, turned 80 years of age. Um, so this event is also for honoring him. Uh, we are fortunate to have three eminent speakers uh, gracing this occasion, Professor Bhutan, Ms. Heather Joseph, Professor Leslie Chan, all of them have lavished their admiration for Professor Arnachalam uh, when they responded to our invitation. So it is great to have you all with us. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, before I hand over the mic uh, to my colleague, a few quick words about Professor Arnachalam's uh, background. Uh, he was uh, born in a small town called Devakotai, roughly halfway between Trichy and Madurai in uh, uh, Tamil Nadu. He went to three different schools before he finished high school. And uh, during all his uh, school education, Tamil was uh, the medium of instruction. Though his own preference was to major in English at college level, his father's uh, gentle nudge sent him to chemistry instead. And uh, here we are to reap the benefits of this uh, uh, early choice. Uh, he went to Alagappa College for his uh, Bachelor of uh, Science degree, and uh, he went to Anamala University in Chidambaram for his Master's uh, degree. So from these uh, small town origins, he made uh, several key choices in his 30s, uh, which uh, took him to major centers of scholarship and activism across the world. Among his achievements, I would mention just three. Uh, his pioneering work in the use of scientometrics as a policy analysis tool for India, uh, his work at uh, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation on the use of information and uh, communication technologies for uh, uh, rural development, and his passionate advocacy for promoting open access. And that is also the reason why uh, this event is being organized and is honored today. So it is a uh, persistent uh, activism uh, that has played a major role in bringing open access to the forefront of policy discussions, so much so that it features now in a separate chapter in the draft national STA policy document, uh, which was uh, released uh, late last year for uh, public consultations. And uh, uh, even as we speak, it is uh, sort of getting finalized and uh, it should see the light of day sometime soon. Uh, so with this background, <coughs> uh, you now see the reasons why uh, his uh, colleagues at our center, as well as in the library and information sciences community in India, are absolutely thrilled uh, to be associated with this event. So uh, here we are to observe and celebrate both the Open Access Week and to honor our mentor and guru. Um, so once again, we welcome you all to this uh, session. Uh, it is my pleasant duty to invite uh, my colleague, Dr. Momita Kole to moderate this event. Uh, over to you, Momita. Good. Uh, thanks a lot, Abhi. Uh, yeah. So again, hello and welcome to this webinar celebrating the International Open Access Week 
2021. So I'm Momita, as Abhi already mentioned, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Department of Science and Technology Center for Policy Research at IIC Center. And I will be your host on this evening along with my colleague, Dr. Jenny Scovius. So this week's, uh, this year's OA Week event at IIC is the fifth in a series of such uh, annual events that we are organizing. It is also special as it's being held in the honor of our dear Professor Subhaya Arunachalam. Although the pandemic played a spoil sports on the physical celebration, as you can see, but it has not dampened, but in fact boosted the open access spirit. So today's session will feature three eminent speakers. And without further ado, I request my co-host, Dr. Janice, to introduce the speaker. Janice, over to you. Thank you, Mamata, uh, and good evening, everyone. Our first speaker, Professor Padmanabhan Balram, is a well-known Indian biochemist and the former director of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He's a recipient of India's third highest civilian honor, the Padma Bhushan. It's an absolute delight to have you here with us, Professor Balram, and I hand over the session to you for sharing your thoughts on Professor Subhaya Arunachalam, Scientometrics and the Open Science Movement. Over to you, Professor. Before I share my thoughts, can I share my screen? Professor Balram, please. So uh, there is one uh, white button with the arrow up arrow. I've got that all right. Mm. But my screen is not coming on. Do you see my screen? Uh, no, no, we don't see. Uh... I think you have to open the full your PowerPoint the presentation and keep it. I opened it. OK. And then share the screen. In case if you're not figuring out, uh, Professor Balram, you can sh uh, quickly send it to me. Uh, I will share it from my end then. In case. Okay. Let me give it a moment. Yes, it has come. Do you see? Yes, now it has come. Yes. It's come. Wonderful. Let me see if I can make it full screen. And you can still see it. It takes a few minutes, like maybe a little time. Yeah, I think it's coming on. It's there, but yeah, it's now on full screen. OK, thank you. My apologies for this slight hiccup. You know, when I was invited to speak at this meeting, uh, marking the open access week, I was reluctant because I don't have very much to say on open access. But then when I was told that you were also honoring uh, an old friend of mine, Subhaya Arunachalam, uh, I said I would of course speak. And therefore, what I've chosen to do is to speak a little bit about Subhaya Arunachalam, Scientometrics, which he brought to India, and a little bit about open access. This slide of mine is really my acknowledgements. Uh, all my interest in Scientometrics began in the library of the Indian Institute of Science when I was young. 
when in the mid 1970s, I used to read Eugene Garfield's current contents. And I would read the column that Garfield wrote week after week. And then over the years, I came to know Arunachalam. And then I came to know two other people who are also pictured on the slide. So I would like to acknowledge them. Ratnakar, who was also from the library and information science community, and Satya Narayana, who, who also began in the Indian Institute of Science. All of them began in the Indian Institute of Science. So in a way, today's talk is a tribute to Arunachalam's contributions in bringing scientometrics to India and then being a tireless advocate of the open access movement. Garfield, whom one could well regard as the founding father of the field of scientometrics, although there are others, wrote this famous paper in science in 1955. I would only like to read you the second part of his title, which says, a new dimension in documentation through association of ideas. This is what attracted me to scientometrics, because you could now trace the association of ideas. And Garfield introduced the idea of what he called the historiograph. Citation indices today are more misused than used. But I'd like to show you some ways in which Garfield used them. In 1984, just after the 19 Nobel Prizes had been announced, Garfield wrote an essay and he described the physics prize, which went to Subramaniam Chandrasekhar that year. So all of us in India were very happy to read the essay. Garfield also did an analysis of Chandrasekhar's papers and eventually in passing noted that he had also worked in the field of liquid crystals. Sometime later, in February of 1985, he published a correction note. And there he says that he mixed up two S. Chandrasekhar's. One was Subramaniam Chandrasekhar, the astrophysicist. The other was Shivaramakrishna Chandrasekhar, the liquid crystal physicist. Both of them were very important scientists. And this mix up happened. But then in the correction note, this is what he says. Our diligent colleague and correspondent in New Delhi, S. Arunachalam, editor of the Indian Journal of Technology, not only called this error to my attention, but he also correctly points out that the total citation counts for these two gentlemen were probably merged. And this was true. Arunachalam in the mid 1980s must have been one among the very few people to look at all of this so carefully. Sometime later, in April of 1986, Garfield published another essay which I read in the library of the Indian Institute of Science. This was entitled Mapping Cholera Research and the Impact of Shambhunath Day of Calcutta. He had spelled day's wrong, uh, name wrong, but nevertheless, it was the first time I'd ever heard the name. And then here it was, Garfield writing about him and saying, that his work had had a fundamental impact on cholera research. I remember at that time discussing this with Arunachalam. And then Arunachalam told me that in a visit that he'd made to the National Library of Medicine after this had appeared, he'd actually seen a letter in the Joshua Lederberg archives in which Lederberg had apparently nominated Day for the Nobel Prize. Garfield goes on to write in his essay that there are parallels between Barbara McClintock, the 1983 Nobel Prize winner, and they. They were both prone to seclusion and intellectual isolation. So I was intrigued by Day. And then when a couple of years later, I joined the journal Current Science, the then editor, Professor Ramaseshan, suggested that we do special issues because the journal had fallen into bad times and did not get enough articles. I chose SN Day as a subject of the first issue, and this was in the year 1988. 
I knew nothing about day. I knew nothing about cholera toxin. But with the leads that I had and with Arunachalam's encouragement, I began to write to people. The first person I wrote to was Joshua Lederberg. And I asked him whether he would write an article for this issue. I was also naive at that time, so I asked him, did you nominate him for the Nobel Prize? He wrote back a very gracious letter saying he would, of course, write. But he didn't answer my question on whether he had nominated Day for the Nobel Prize. But this told me that Day was very highly regarded by biologists abroad, especially those working in the field of cholera. So when I began to write to all of them, they all responded and we produced this issue. We also discovered that Day had been invited to a Nobel Symposium in 1978. And this was a symposium many, many years after he had retired in his late 1950s. He makes these remarks in that symposium. He says that I wish to make a few personal remarks. I've been dead since the early 1960s. I have been exhumed by the Nobel Symposium Committee. And so I was very excited to include this in the special issue of Current Science. I wrote to colleagues of Day, his friends who had helped him, and then they wrote an article about him. And this they say, he died on April 15th, 1985. A few hours before his death, when he was in a state of coma, a letter arrived from S. Arunachalam, editor, Indian Journal of Technology, requesting him to get in touch with Eugene Garfield, who was interested to know his biodata and professional contributions. Day could not be informed about this. This terse conclusion tells us something about the sad story of SN Day. It also tells us something about what scientometrics can sometimes do. It can exhume from the dead people who have done wonderful work. But today's literature looks like this. It's what nature called in 2014 a paper mountain. If you just take the first page of every paper that's been published in 2014 and stack them up, it will reach the height of Mount Kilimanjaro. And of course, along the y-axis here, you can see the number of papers which have never been cited, the number of papers which have been cited from one to nine times, and those which have been cited 10 to 99, and the very and the superstars which go much higher. Why do I show you this? Because scientists are animals who like to write papers. And I've just paraphrased Lewis Carroll, who said that the proper definition of a man is an animal that writes letters. The most highly cited papers, the superstars of the scientific literature, are almost all in biochemistry and a few others in theoretical chemistry. This is largely because it's methods which are cited most and the biomedical literature is the one which has the largest volume. So using citation counts without understanding disciplinary differences is something that one should not do. But why do we have so many papers? Why don't we just have the best papers? Garfield asked this question in 1970. He said that the growth of science is dependent upon an accumulation of many mediocre results that are produced by hard work. He, of course, put mediocre in quotes. And then he said, Long live the mediocrities. Without them, how could they be geniuses? Forty years later, in this article in Current Science, Arunachalam and his colleagues, Madan and Chandrasekhar, wrote this article. They were analyzing publications from India and China. This was at a time when China and India did not have such a large gulf in scientific output as it is today. And when they did this analysis, they came to this conclusion. They said it's heartening that the production of research papers is increasing in India and even more so in China. And then he says, the next step is for researchers in the two countries to write papers that will be cited far more often than now. But what attracted me to this article was this quote. They quote Cha Chairman Mao. Not many people quote Chairman Mao. And they say, every quality manifests itself in a certain quantity, and without quantity, there can be no quality. This is, in fact, true. Without volume, it's very difficult to find those exceptional pieces of work. 
There have been many other analyses in the years afterwards. In 2018, this interesting analysis appeared in Nature about scientists who publish a paper every five days. This is because of the corporatization of science, where a single scientist here resembling an octopus can now collaborate with people in 20 different laboratories and have a paper which has 100 co-authors. This has been well illustrated in many of the papers which have appeared during the COVID pandemic. But scientometrics has also led to what I would like to call the metrics obsession. And recently there was a paper in PLOS Biology, which has had wide discussion in India. And this is largely because the authors come from Stanford and the Stanford brand now lends respectability to anything that is written from there. But when you look at a formula like this, formula for calculating the career long impact of a scientist and you have an equation like this you then really begin to wonder about the directions in which scientometrics has gone it's no longer looking at what garfield called an association of ideas if one wants to give a talk today and i have given them one might call discuss scientometrics and science publishing I would then add the subtitle, The Corrupting Influence of the Marketplace. Or one could talk about modern science publishing. It's really an enterprise which is driven by two attributes, greed on the part of the publishers and vanity on the part of scientists. And the cartoons that I have here really illustrate the problem. Greed, of course, it turns out, because if you look at this statement a few years ago, Elsevier's profit margin was 36%. It was higher than the profit margins in 2010 posted by Apple, Google, or Amazon. And of course, publishers would like to maximize profit. And this cartoon summarizes it well. It turns out that the public hates the culture of corporate greed. And of course, within the boardrooms, they will say, let's figure out how we can monetize that hate. And that monetization of hate has happened because of the takeover or the hijacking of the open access movement by commercial publishers and societies which have now teamed up with commercial publishers. So today you pay and publish in mainstream journals. You also pay and publish in predatory journals. But the sad state of scientific publishing can be traced back to Robert Maxwell. And I found this rather interesting uh, review of a book on Robert Maxwell, which appeared earlier this year. It says it's very easy to see Maxwell as a forerunner of Trump. And in many respects, Maxwell was a brilliant businessman, says the author. He became the world's largest, most successful publisher of scientific journals in the 50s. And that didn't happen by accident. He purchased Butterworths in 1951 for 13,000 pounds, sold it to Elsevier in 1991 for 440 million pounds. And Maxwell is, should be best known by this wonderful quotation. He said science publishing is a perpetual financing machine. He introduced the letters journal in organic chemistry, tetrahedron letters in those days, two page communications, which the authors typed and which was photo offset. It turned out that on his 60th birthday, even the most distinguished scientists in the world, Carl Gerasi here, dedicated their papers to the founder and publisher of Podiaman. <laughs> it would be nice if you muted your mics. Vanity is, of course, on the part of scientists. And in the days after Maxwell, journals have appeared in the 70s, first from MIT Press, Cell, which then became Cell Press in 1999, acquired by Elsevier. Benjamin Levin, whom I picture here, has been described. He was very clever. He realized that scientists are very vain and wanted to be part of this selective members club. Cell was it, and you had to get your paper in there. He's quoting Randy Sheckman, a Nobel laureate who has now started a journal 
called eLife. Again, it's a club and everybody would like to get into it and you have to pay substantially to get your papers published there. In the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the very prominent neuroscientist Solomon Snyder had an article with this title, Science Interminable, Blame Ben, because he exhorted authors to refrain from publication until they completed their stories. The result is modern cell biology and molecular biology has papers which have an immense amount of data in them. They take years to put together in order to get into these journals. Very often it turns out that there's a very high retraction rate in these journals. And very often you will read this, that such and such a figure which has been doctored or which is wrong is not important for the conclusions of the paper. Then, of course, one wonders, why was it in the paper in the first place? This is because of the demand for what is called the complete story. So in science publishing, Robert Maxwell invented the least publishable unit in the 1960s. And the deluge of data and the illusion of the complete story was invented by Benjamin Levin in the 1980s. There is now, of course, what I would call the subversive role of paid open access. The commercial publishers, including those started by very prominent scientists, the PLOS group of journals, which started in 2003. These were doomed to the state they are in today, journals which make money. They are journals which are out of reach for scientists in most parts of the world who can't afford to pay and publish. When Arunachalam was a tireless open access campaigner uh, many, many years ago, we were talking about a different kind of open access. We were talking about institutional archives where people would deposit all the published papers and they would then be available. They would bypass the copyright laws and so forth. But today we have hybrid journals where authors pay to publish and readers pay to read. We've also had the rise of the open archives. So you don't need institutional archives anymore. With search engines and so on, you can get into all these. The physicists had it first. The biologists came later and the chemists came in last. But if you look at Chem Archive, it's now supported by ACS, the Royal Society of Chemistry and the German Chemical Society. All of them are now commercial publishers and therefore I would say they are in fact subverting the open access movement. Today's paid open access journals are both supposedly respectable and also designated as predatory because they don't have peer review. Author career advance requires peer review and therefore archive postings are now only for establishing priority claims. This cartoon sums it up all. When you talk about archives, physicists may say we've been doing it since the 1990s and nobody seems to care. And that's the situation with archives. We also have the pirate sites, which are the only sites where people from developing countries uh, go to for the scientific literature. That is Alexandra Elbakian's Sci Hub. This, of course, is a kind of Robin Hood approach. And the pirate servers now serve as the only source of information for very large numbers of PhD students in India, across India. And as I conclude this presentation, I will tell you that there is an ongoing court case now being fought in the Delhi High Court. And this court case pits Sai Hub, and that's the founder of Sai Hub, there against these three gigantic publishers here. You have Elsevier on the one hand, Wiley and the American Chemical Society. It's a sad state for a scientific society to join with the commercial publishers to block access to the scientific literature. In paying a tribute to Subayar Nachalam, I must say that he is the man who really tirelessly promoted open access in India. And when he brought people like Stephen Harnard and Peter Suba, Leslie Chan and others to Bangalore, we were in fact at that time thinking of a utopian idea for open access. 
But I now realize that the world of scientific publishing is dominated by commercial interests, which are fueled by the culture of the scientific enterprise itself. Unless these change, we will celebrate Open Access Week year after year, but access to scientific information will still remain an impossible dream for most people in the poorer countries who are trying to do scientific research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Balram, for highlighting some key issues on the cooperatization of science, on metrics obsession, and of course, how commercial publishing is subverting the open access movement in itself. Uh, thank you very much. It was indeed a very enlightening talk. Um, we now move and we have the privilege of having our second speaker, a world-renowned open access advocate, Heta Joseph. She is the executive director of the organization called Spark, which is Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. Under her stewardship, Spark has become widely recognized as the leading international force for effective open access policies and practices. She will deliberate on open by default and equitable by design, the future of the open access movement. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just uh, quickly request all the others, whoever is not speaking, please uh, turn off their cameras because that will help in the bandwidth issue, I guess. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can you see my slides all right? Can you see yes, you see that we can see your slides. Perfect. Thank you so much. It really is um, an honor to be here, not only celebrating uh, Global Open Access Week, but particularly to be able to contribute to the celebration of my colleague and friend Arun. Um, we're about to mark 20 years of the open access movement. Um, and I think we heard in the opening, the wonderful opening talk, uh, just how important this year's Global Open Access Week theme, it matters how we open knowledge, building structural equity is particularly important to us this year, as it's a, a natural point for us to look back and take stock of where we are as the open access movement. And while um, I completely agree uh, that we've, uh, we have made tremendous progress forward, we are clearly faced with a reality that even as a greater amount of scholarly literature and particularly scientific articles um, are being opened, we still have far too many inequitable structures within the system of sharing science and scholarship that are, they remain and they're actually actively being reinforced um, even within uh, the uh, structures of the open access movement. The, the, I think that as we're, as we're looking back, we're increasingly recognizing how important it is for us to think about how we can change the trajectory um, of the movement. And from our perspective at Spark, we're increasingly recognizing the need to return to the principles that really first grounded the open access movement and to be very critical in analyzing how and actually whether the decisions that we're making both individually and collectively are moving us closer to um, uh, our, our shared goals. At its heart, the open access movement is a social justice movement. And one of the last in-person meetings that I got to participate in um, prior to the pandemic was a Pan-African Symposium on Open Access to Knowledge, where the keynote speaker was a South African advocate and law professor, uh, Thuli Mendesila, who um, actually helped to draft South Africa's current constitution. And Thule opened the meeting by contextualizing the importance of open access to knowledge and information within a social justice framing. And she reminded us that while social justice movements might have widely varying foci, they can be centered on gender equality, civil rights, or anti-globalization, they all share the commonality that they're firmly rooted in the way that human rights are manifested in the everyday lives of people at every level of society, which really is critical to keep in mind because access to knowledge, sharing knowledge, 
is a human right. And it's enshrined as such as a human right in the U United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where Article 27 states that everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and in particular, to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. And the critical importance of this right is reflected across the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which serve as the UN's current blueprint and action plan to ensure a better future for all citizens of the world. Ensuring access to knowledge is recognized as a cross-cutting strategy that has the potential to accelerate progress towards all of the SDGs, which when we look at them, they're almost universally dependent on the free flow of information and knowledge, both among communities and across geographic borders in order for them to succeed. And the SDGs are large scale goals. They underscore that, that the changes that are needed to improve the way that we share knowledge have to take place on a global systems level as well as be firmly rooted in social justice principles. That to be truly effective, our strategies and solutions in the open access movement have to intentionally and comprehensively address all four primary social justice concerns. Access, yes, but also participation, equity, and rights. And ultimately, this is what drives and what has always driven our advocacy for open access. Open access was really born out of unprecedented opportunity. Um, in 2001, the Open Society Institutes brought together a diverse group of stakeholders to look at optimizing how to use network digital technology, the internet, to better share research and scholarship. The result of that meeting with which um, my predecessor at Spark was uh, fortunate to participate in, along with Leslie Chen, who we'll hear from next, um, was the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which did several important things. It articulated a declaration that contained a set of principles, a definition of open access, and also a set of strategic actions. It's a foundational document that we used as a blueprint from the beginning of the open access movement and I think has a continued relevancy and uh, increased importance as we look towards the next phase of the open access movement. The, the Budapest Declaration really talks about why open access, right? The, an old tradition and a new technology have converged to make possible an unprecedented public good. It's that vision based on opportunity. The opportunity that we had for the very first time with the advent of the internet to marry this technology with the long tradition of scholars freely sharing the results of their work. And not for profit um, motivation, right? But in order to produce a new public good. And that public good is nothing short of the worldwide distribution of the peer reviewed literature, along with a complete free and unrestricted access to it by all. The, one of the most important things about the Budapest Open Access Initiative and Declaration was that it focused on the public, open for the public good, not open for open sake, not simply open because we can, because we have the technology, not open because open is oftentimes better than closed, but open in order for us as a global community to achieve some very specific things. The Declaration talked specifically about opening up access to this layer of knowledge, the peer-reviewed journal literature, in order to accelerate research, enrich education, share the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich, make the, this information as useful as it can be, and lay the foundation for uniting humanity in a common intellectual conversation and quest for knowledge. The Budapest Declaration deliberately and intentionally centered issues of equity as uh, outlining the path forward. And when the declaration was first uh, signed uh, and adopted, and um, we began to really try to put it into practice 20 years ago, um, we, we faced an uphill battle, um, but we many good things happened. I would say that now 20 years in, um, unlike when we first started, we're not fighting about or arguing or trying to convince people about uh, whether open access is 
uh, the, 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 the preferable path forward for scientific and scholarly communication, but rather how. Uh, the Open Access Week really reflects, theme really reflects this central focus on how do we get to open access, not whether do we get to, not, not, not if or whether we get to open access. Um, for better or for worse, we have lots of open access journal outlets. Um, more importantly, we have uh, infrastructure in the form of open repositories and archives. And more importantly, even than, than the individual archives, the archives themselves, we have emerging networks of um, local, regional, and hopefully soon global uh, repositories. We have policies that have emerged from private and public funders alike, uh, which reinforce the desirability of open access as an end goal and an increasing amount of um, attention, at least, on working on incentives in the higher education community, uh, higher ed institutions, and within research funders to reform the system of incentives and rewards that underpins uh, the scientific and scholarly communication system to better reward open communication. All of these things are, are, are you know, really good things. I would say we saw during the COVID pandemic, you know, one illustration of just how centrally important open access is and has become to the community um, when one of the first things that happened when the pandemic began to emerge is that we saw science ministers from uh, more than a dozen countries around the world immediately call for uh, the creation of an open access database of all coronavirus related papers that became an essential tool for helping the science community um, successfully, uh, more successfully address uh, um, uh, the pandemic. All of these things are good things, but we can't ignore the fact that we've also had some pretty negative consequences um, come out of the open access movement as well that we need to focus on. At first, when we were, we were advocating for open access, um, as I think uh, Arun can attest, we dealt with really blanket opposition from publishers, um, commercial publishers, uh, society publishers, uh, really pushing back and saying uh, open access is an idea that A will never work and B will never get behind. That was difficult enough to fight, but particularly given the power imbalances between uh, scientists, advocates, and the commercial publishing interests. But as the years have passed, something um, has happened that I think is very important. The outright opposition of the publishers has turned to co-option of open access, with particularly commercial publishers increasingly uh, um, paying lip service to supporting open access, but only when the how, when the implementation uh, serves their financial interests. This is even harder to address as an advocacy community. Um, and it's compounded uh, by the pressure that we feel oftentimes um, from that the, the, the publishers press uh, on funders and researchers uh, to, uh, uh, to, to say that they are essential players in the research process, right? That they deserve uh, or, or are entitled to a, a continued role in the scientific research enterprise. And this focus on preserving journals and journal publishers' traditional roles, traditional positions, and traditional business models has really taken the focus away from the open access movement being able to concentrate on creating the real structural change that's needed to have open access succeed. This has led to real division within the open access uh, community uh, with some in the community you know, really pressuring um, libraries, researchers, uh, scientists, faculty, students to consider commercial publishing interests as important stakeholders rather than calling them out as a major contributor to market dysfunction and perpetuating systemic inequities. It's resulted in an increasing push for open access to become synonymous with gold, high cost article processing or APC based publishing in traditional journals, at best ignoring uh, systemic inequities and at its worst really reinforcing them. And as a movement, it's very important that we as, as uh, collectively and individually remember that this isn't what we signed up to advocate for. I think the biggest challenge for the open access community for the next phase of the open access movement, whether it's the next two or 20 years, the challenges center 
uh, around taking on um, the need for us to unite our forces globally and to intentionally focus on the critical work of prioritizing and recentering issues of equity in every individual and collective decision we make about how we choose to open access to knowledge. We need to center issues of equity um, in every decision we make from what business models we choose to support for communicating uh, scientific and scholarly um, outputs, what communications channels we choose uh, to use to communicate our work, what technology we build and decide to invest in, what rights we empower the users and producers of knowledge with, what outputs and behaviors we incentivize and reward, and really critically, how we construct our leadership and governance um, bodies of not only communication channels, but also the infrastructure and the institutions that underpin the uh, communication of science and scholarship. This sort of recentering of the need to focus on um, issues of Um, is critically important to us. And we've recently been fortunate to have some high level reinforcement of the imperative for centering these things in the push for openness uh, from some very important quarters. It's been extremely helpful to have UNESCO focusing on uh, creating recommendations for moving towards open access in specific and um, open science writ large. The recent recommendations uh, issued through UNESCO are really helpful in repositioning open access intentionally and very visibly in the context of the full research flow, the global research enterprise, and also in a social justice framework. The recommendations which will um, uh, hopefully be ratified uh, later next month by the 193 member states uh, that, that participate in UNESCO provide a really important framework for helping us to highlight the specific challenges that uh, we need to address across the diversity of stakeholder groups that make up the open community and the open movement writ large. It's very different um, the, the actions that we are and the decision points that we're faced with making on a daily basis, uh, are, they're different for each of us depending on what role we play in the science or scholarly communications ecosystem. If you're a researcher, the pressures and the decision points to move towards centering equity and opening up access to knowledge in a way that centers these concerns look very different than, than if you're a research funder or the head of an academic institution. And I wanna give a, a specific example of what these choice points look, for, uh, look like for me and the community that my organization represents, which is uh, academic and research libraries who play an important role um, in, this, in this enterprise. Really for the past several years, we've been under ever increasing daily pressure to support a transition to open access by um, committing to do one action and a single action. And that is committing to taking the money that we as libraries currently spend on journal subscriptions and using it to support flipping journals from subscription-based business models to gold APC supported open access. The push for libraries to sign these so-called transformative agreements is coming from a variety of corners. It's coming from some funders um, at a very large scale uh, through Coalition S in particular, um, that you may be familiar with. It's coming from some organizations of open access advocates uh, like the OA2020 initiative that the Max Planck Institute is promoting, and it's coming from, frankly, primarily commercial publishers. The pitch that I and the libraries that make up our organization hear on a daily basis is that this is the easy route, the fast route to open access. All we need to do as a library is simply commit to spending the same amount of money with the same publishers that we currently are spending and simply convert that point of payment from subscriptions to APCs. They're, these transformative deals are touted to us as cost neutral deals that will increase the number of open access articles available to everyone around the world. They also often come with a promise that will change researcher behavior, 
because researchers who have grant funding will also commit to contributing some amount of money towards covering the cost of the APC fee, which will diversify uh, the sources of money that we need to cover costs. If you're a library, it sounds pretty good, right? Low effort, no extra money on our part, and at the end of the day, more open access articles. Everyone wins. Well, I guess everyone wins if all we care about is simply increasing the number of open access articles that are published and not in addressing any of the structural equity issues that are endemic to the current system. What, what's central to our work at Spark and what we find ourselves doing in the library community every day is having to work to unpack what the end results of these kinds of APC-based transformative agreements actually look like. And when we do that with our community, which we do again regularly, the problems are readily apparent. When, while, while transformative agreements may look and may actually be advantageous for some subset of researchers who are affiliated with the large institutions who can afford them, we see that they deeply disadvantage those at the vast majority of member institutions in Spark, um, also in uh, countries, regions, and localities around the world who simply will never be able to afford to uh, thrive in a pay-to-play environment. They entrench the role that large commercial publishers play in the scholarly and scientific communication arena and ensure their continued dominance. They continue that we're going to be operating um, in, in, in treating knowledge as a commodity and this as a market rather than moving back towards the communication of knowledge as a public good. Um, this clearly also disadvantages the not-for-profit scholarly societies and university-based uh, publishers and communications channels. These kinds of transformative, uh, transformative agreements or so-called transformative agreements also um, really incentivize researchers to publish in journals that are covered by, uh, by the deals that libraries can sign, right? Which are so often expensive journals that trade on uh, not only their name, but also their high impact factors, which further entrenches a deeply in, in, inequitable and problematic metric. Um, which has the knock-on effect then of really damaging and restricting bibliodiversity in a myriad of important ways. We've seen from institutions who have signed these trans transformative agreements that they very often privilege established researchers also over early career researchers and really um, minimize to ignore the needs of researchers based in less well-resourced institutions. They also have the effect of prioritizing well-funded areas uh, of research over those areas that are equally important, but less resourced areas, which in turn perpetuates that myth that the most important research is only done in large institutions, in topics of importance to that particular community, published in English language journals with high commercial prestige. I, I find myself increasingly frustrated um, uh, in hearing the defense of such agreements pointing to contributions of equity that these deals claim to make. And they boil down to you know, really the argument that we're, we want you to sign these deals. They will contribute to an equitable strategy for opening up access to knowledge because they will make more articles available for everyone to access. And again, more articles, yes, but at what cost? We hear the defense that uh, APC discounts and waivers are available for those people who may need them. But we've seen over the last 20 years how, how offering waivers and discounts is not a real solution to addressing fundamental inequities. It reinforces power imbalances in research institutions, uh, and in some cases, it actually creates new ones. And it's demeaning to those who are forced to have to ask for them on a regular basis to add their voice to this common intellectual global conversation that we in the open access movement seek to promote and that the BOAI so eloquently um, articulated. When supporters also say uh, in defense that, well, these agreements will also kind of force researchers to put their own financial um, skin in the game, if you will, by contributing their own money to pay for APCs, We've seen the reality is that there are very few cases in which either the reader or the writer has to pay anything 
in most cases, it still is a third party, the library or the National Library Consortia, who generally pays um, pays uh, pays, uh, pays uh, for um, uh, pays the costs, and for the lion's share of research that's publicly funded, ultimately it's still the taxpayer who ends up footing the bill. I think. The, to me, this is the example that we see on a daily basis in my community that illustrates exactly why it does matter. It matters deeply how we open um, how we open up our access to knowledge, and that issues of equity and inclusivity need to be central to um, any discussion of how uh, uh, the open access system and scholarly communication system needs to be structured moving forward. I do want to say that my organization, organization and the open access movement um, are working very hard uh, and are committed to not just saying no to models like APC based transformative agreements, but to actively contributing to designing and supporting models, initiatives, and agreements that we can say yes to that will truly transform the system by correcting structural inequities and not just alter the point of payment. Some examples of these include models that continue to support journals to a certain degree, um, collective and cooperative value-based models, not cost-based models or cost recovery-based models that include things like the subscribe to open model piloted by annual reviews and now um, being more widely used by some not-for-profit organizations models that provide institutional based support like diamond open access uh, that promote um, the production and the communication of knowledge on a local basis uh, that looks um, a lot like uh, the uh, journal communication and article uh, communication ecosystem that has grown up in latin america for example but more importantly we really want to focus on models that move us beyond our dependency on journals and articles as the single currency of scholarly and scientific communication uh, that's used and that's valued. So that means focusing on investing in and supporting um, fe uh, robust federated networks of uh, open repositories uh, and overlay services for um, translating, transforming these repositories from um, archive based uh, and solely sort of archive based solutions to more active communication channels as well as um, our archival services. It, it means also looking at and supporting um, journal agnostic funder supported open platforms, investing money in increasing the capacity and quality services on preprint networks, and really looking at uh, taking money that we were previously spending on subscriptions to support new and novel community-based, community-owned communications channels as they emerge. And I think in the next phase of the open access movement, um, this is our biggest challenge. We have to make the decisions to invest in these and other emerging models in a specific way. When we do this, we have to make sure that we're consistently holding ourselves accountable to our commitment to centering equity by asking, does our decision to invest in these kinds of models map back to the original goals of the BOAI, of the Budapest Open Access Initiative, and the principles it articulated? Does it map back to the UNESCO principles? Does it support more than just one pillar of the social justice framework in which the open access movement operates? Does it do more than just open access to a larger number of articles? Does it also support improving equity, improving participation, guaranteeing rights to those participating in knowledge production and knowledge accessing knowledge? We recognize that equity has to be deliberately and proactively built into the knowledge sharing system by each of us individually and collectively at all possible critical cho choice points and not left to be bolted on later as an afterthought. I think the inextricable link between knowledge and the fulfillment of our vision of knowledge and sharing knowledge as a basic human right serves as a critical reminder of the imperative for each one of us to think critically and act deliberately at every step of the process. It really does matter how we open knowledge. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in today's program. Oh, last slide.
thank you very much for beautifully putting together uh, your thoughts starting right from the budapest declaration and going ahead with uh, the entire summarizing how we can achieve a system which is open by default and equitable by design uh, thank you so much uh, we now move to our third speaker professor leslie chan professor at the department of global uh, development studies at the university of toronto canada he is one of the leading global advocates of open access and is on the advisory board of several international organizations including the san francisco declaration on research assessment the directory of open access journals and the steering committee of invest in open infrastructure it's an absolute delight to listen to professor chan on the theme opening sciences from below over to you professor Okay, so I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, is it working? Yes, yes. You can see my can. slide? Yes, we can see your slide. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the organizer uh, for this panel. And of course, uh, like Professor Bellaram, when I heard that this panel is also in honor of my very dear friend, uh, Professor Arun Natchalam. Uh, I, I, I would not hesitate. Um, and you will see in my talk, uh, I will interweave uh, a lot of lessons uh, that I have learned from Arun. Uh, and uh, I, I would say uh, I owe a lot to what I, uh, in terms of my own thinking and practices, I owe a lot to Arun. Uh, uh, exposure to his way of thinking and but also uh, I have to emphasize Arun is to me the the quintessential uh, human network. Uh, he knows everybody, he knows every institution uh, and he connects people and it is that connectivity, that human connectivities that I want to also put, pay tribute to uh, today. So uh, my, the title of my talk is called Opening Signs from Below. I won't define it. I hopefully, uh, as, I, as I go through my presentation, uh, you will begin to understand what I'm trying to get across in terms of an ideas of opening signs from below. Uh, so there are three key points I like to make. So Professor Balaram has very eloquently uh, highlighted the, the nature of today's commercialization of publications uh, and the, the pressure of the global uh, on the local uh, and, and the kind of pressure to publish uh, and the kind of negative uh, uh, consequences that are resulting from the corruption of, of science from commercialization. Uh, I would say that a lot of this also have very direct impact on local research, local scientists, community researchers uh, and their knowledge system. Uh, and so I think when we, uh, the more I've been thinking about this topic of open science, open access in the last 20 years, the more I think it is important uh, that we strengthen the local and not simply looking at what is important at the global or international level. Uh, so that's theme key point number one. And second point uh, is that social infrastructure is the key as i said it is people like arun people like you who organize this conference and many of you who work uh, 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 in the libraries in in the fields uh, on research uh, you you rely on each other uh, uh, in terms of support uh, and uh, and and all kinds of of, of uh, ability to 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 make and share knowledge so it is not just the technology that is important we have a tendency to focus on the technology infrastructure uh, that we need the next latest shiny new tools and we forgot it is ultimately is human that makes this work. And again, uh, having visited some of the institute in India, particularly the first time I visited India Institute of uh, um, Science and Indian Academy of Science where they publish many of their own journals uh, and looking at all the people that are involved in, in, in making these happen, you realize how important it is the people that make these happen. So we need to think about how we continue to support people as a key uh, in terms of knowledge production and dissemination. And, and as we think about people, it, it reminds us of the third pillar, the third 
point that I'd like to emphasize is that science policies must take into account those who have been marginalized, both intellectually or epistemologically, uh, and they have been made invisible because of the kind of market structures that uh, Professor Balaram talked about. And so, so we need to think about these, these policy implications and think about people uh, uh, from below, so to speak. Uh, Arun uh, and I, as, as I said, have a, a long friendship and, and of course Arun uh, has organized many, many events, been very, very active over the years in promoting open access uh, in India and elsewhere. Someone is, uh, excuse me, could someone mute their microphone, please? Yeah. Um, and um, one of the first uh, uh, workshop that I, I took part in that, uh, that uh, Arun invited me to back in 2002 at the Indian uh, Academy of Science. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the website uh, is no longer there. This is over almost 20 years ago, this, this, this event. But funny enough, I printed out the, the, the web pages. So the other day I was just cleaning my file, happened to run across this this printout. Uh, and, and the reason I want to show is because this picture is important. This is Arun right here uh, up there and Prakash who works at Indian Academy uh, of Science. And uh, this is our very, very dear friend, Barbara Kursoff, uh, who's, who's one of the co-founder of Byline International, one of the earliest open access platform. Uh, and in the back here is a young doctor by the name of D.K. Sahu. Uh, I will come back to the story of D.K. Sahu. Sorry, we don't see the picture. At least I don't see the picture. You don't see any picture? Yeah, I see your face. You see uh, my no, face? No, but no, we can, see, we can see the picture, sir. We can see we the can picture. See. It's fine. Maybe it's I'm fine. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay so, so are you still okay with the picture? Uh, yes, just make it full screen, please. Yeah, please go what ahead. Please go ahead. It's back to full screen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, and you see uh, uh, another picture, another events that that uh, a room put together this time at the uh, 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 Indian Institute of Science. Uh, and you will see uh, a young, handsome Professor Balaram sitting, uh, well, standing over in the far corner here. And this time, D.K. Sahu, the young doctor, is served as one of the resource person for this workshop, bringing together quite a number of scholarly society and journal publishers from different uh, organizations across India. And I got to meet many of these colleagues who still work, we still in connection uh, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and again, just for historical interest, I had the opportunity, the pleasure of doing an interview with Professor Balaram uh, at, at the time, uh, he was the director of the Indian uh, Institute of Science, and he was talking about the importance of institutional repository. So again, for historical interest, you might want to go take a look. And of course, I did an interview of, of, of Arun himself. Uh, at the time, I was calling him Mr. Open Access in India, and he talked about the efficacy he had been doing and some of the wishes he had about policies uh, in India. And again, for historical interest, you, you could take a look. So I'm coming back to this young fellow, D.K. Sahu, on the left-hand side here. So in 2002, when I met D.K. Sahu, he was uh, one of the workshop participants. Uh, by 2004, he's actually uh, started uh, his own journal, online open access journal, started with a couple of them, with the Journal of Postgraduate Medicine. And by 2004, he was getting very, very anxious and ambitious about open access publishing. And two more years later, he established an uh, open access uh, company, book publishing company called Matno Publications. And so he worked primarily with scholarly society across India. Many of them published their own journals, but don't have the infrastructure uh, to publish uh, uh, on, a regular, on a sustainable basis. So Sahu created this platform infrastructure. He hired many programmers, uh, uh, invested in all of his own resources. He gave up his practice as a doctor to start this endeavor. 
uh, and from a few journals with Hofali Society, it grew to almost a couple of hundred journals in a few years. He used a, what's called a freemium model, where people can access the basic HTML content for free, but if you want the, the PDF version, you have to pay a small fee. Uh, he was also able to charge advertisers for the print versions of many of the journals. And so through a few years time with different business income and so forth, he was able to provide open access to a large number of scholarly society publishers across India. And he also began to work with uh, publishers, uh, small independent journal uh, outside of India. So that was a success story. But then come the, 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 the crunch. Uh, Walters Kruer, which is a ger big German publisher, saw the, the, the the dollar signs that, that Matt knows can bring with all the content, uh, particularly with, uh, with uh, health content, uh, many of them focused on uh, the subcontinent and South Asia. Uh, Matt uh, Walters Kluwer saw this as a golden opportunity for them and they acquired Matt No under terms that cannot be disclosed. Uh, but not only did, did uh, Walter Kluwer acquire Matt no, uh, they took over the entire infrastructure itself. Uh, so all the programming and all the underlying peer review uh, infrastructures and, and publishing infrastructure, XML markup and all that thing, thing those those technical uh, know-how were all taken by, by, the, by the takeover. Now, if you go to the website today, you'll notice that uh, this, this Matt, whoops, uh, Matt no now have 480 journals, and so they obviously, Walter Kluwer has grown this, this, this business. Uh, and on the tagline on the top here, you see he says, this is, is a leading global publishing service uh, providing peer review of scholarly open access journals. Uh, and so this is another example that speak to Professor Balaram's uh, uh, identification of these commercial, uh, co commercial publishers that are really taking advantage of open access, but not simply of open access, but of uh, local know-how and local infrastructure. And we don't tend to think about that. We tend to think, oh, well, India, what does India have to offer? Or for that matter, what other global South country has to offer in terms of publishing? But this kind of takeover, it goes on on a regular basis, historically and in the current time. And whenever a Western powerful entity comes in and take it from uh, any uh, uh, global South uh, uh, endeavor, they don't give them the credit. They just uh, just take over and, and take over everything lock, stock and barrel. Uh, this to me is a form of uh, it could, it's similar to me as a form of new form of settler colonialism, but only in the digital space. And at the same time, it make invisible a lot of the local uh, local initiative and local effort that has been built up over time and simply uh, diminished by these kind of uh, international takeover. Uh, and again, the infrastructure to me is always uh, a key, but is often not talked about. So again, let's wind back the clock a little bit. Again, the first time I met Arun, actually, he, uh, what was so profoundly important for me was that he, he, Arun at the time in the early 2000s was still a fellow at the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. And Professor Swaminathan is uh, widely credited as the, uh, as, the, uh, as the founder of the Green Revolution in India, has uh, revolutionized a lot of research on agriculture, but he also uh, uh, set up this very important research foundation with a key mission of, uh, of knowledge sharing with the poorest of the poor. And, and Professor Sabinathan uh, famously always says, if agriculture fails, everything else will fail. And India builds on agriculture. And so it, it is important that the, uh, the, the, the farmers themselves be seen as the knowledge holders and the knowledge producers. If the farmers are decimated, uh, we will all be decimated because their knowledge is the key to our survival. So a lot of the program that was set up at the at the Swaminathan Research Foundation, using the technology of the time 20 years ago, was to use basic technologies to make sure that 
uh, information uh, shared between uh, uh, different stakeholders. Uh, and again, the stakeholder, key stakeholders to uh, Professor Swaminathan's are the farmers uh, and the women uh, who also work uh, in a large percentage in the rural area, uh, they hold the key to, uh, to knowledge exchange. And open up one of those brochures, uh, which I kept from a long time ago, uh, I'm reminded of how much of these principle that we're talking about, so as Heather just referred to, about, about equity and inclusion. Uh, and these are all built into their program from the ground up. And I particularly am reminded about the importance of, of the right hand bottom here is about uh, well, the right hand top there about social inclusion. And, and of course, uh, it hark back to uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, pathway where empowerment starts with the poorest and the most underprivileged women and men, and those who are often disregarded by society as not even worthy of being considered as uh, uh, part of society. And so a lot of these programs, these rural knowledge program and uh, the village center program and human center program talks about communication, not only between scientists from lab to lab, but between scientists and farmers working on the ground, but also from farmers working on the ground back to the scientists. And of course, most importantly, between the farmers themselves. And so these type of network of exchanges uh, center all these type of players, uh, not just the scientists themselves. And I think over time in the West, we have there's a tendency to center the scientists as the end all and be all and their publications and their output becomes the measure of scientific progress uh, to the detriment of a lot of the local, local knowledge that are being forgotten or even, even system, systematically erased one form or another. One example being this digital colonialism that I've referred to, but they are indigenous knowledge, local knowledge are constantly systematically erased everywhere in the world. And to me, that's one of the biggest threat to science, uh, to, to, to the future of uh, well-being, especially of the system of this existential crisis we are facing with climate change today. Uh, again, back to, back to uh, Arun. Uh, the last trip I made with Arun was in 2012. Uh, and we roamed through literally quite a number of cities in, in, Car in, in Kerala. And, and, and in Kerala, many of you know about their healthcare system and many of the social system that are quite different from other parts of India. And I get to meet some of the very interesting projects, uh, labor movement, uh, local open source software, uh, uh, independent uh, startups and so forth, a vibrancy of very, very many different local communities generating knowledge, making knowledge and sharing knowledge. Uh, and these kind of uh, understanding have shaped my own research. Uh, and over the last few years, uh, my research has been very much focused on uh, science with the people and for the people. And that open, open access has to think beyond just the scientific community and the academic community, but to include knowledge holders, makers from across the spectrum of society. And so openness is really about opening up knowledge uh, of everybody because we really should uh, we are all better off with a much more diversity of knowledge uh, and of course particularly we need to focus on knowledge that has been historically excluded and marginalized uh, and again to stigma about knowledge from the south or from the margins that are not worthy of of, of scientific attention we need to change that mindset uh, and i have the privilege of working with a number of colleagues uh, Professor Butthall, uh, Florence Piron, who unfortunately passed away recently, Professor Rajas Tendon, who is a, a founder of Participatory Research India based in Delhi, and have learned, uh, and of course, Professor Lorna Williams, an indigenous scholar from uh, the west coast of Canada. Uh, and these, these scholars have taught me a great deal about working with community and centering community knowledge uh, and the Rajas groups in in, uh, in Delhi, the Priya uh, has been doing this kind of work for over 40 years. And so again, looking to the local for uh, what we have been neglecting to me 
is a key uh, uh, theme. Uh, I'm showing this picture because I remember one time we were walking uh, in, in one of the market in Kerala and I was just fascinated with all the different bananas and the fruits uh, that that was in the market. And of course, there, there are hundreds of varieties of bananas uh, from uh, across the continent and, and around the world. Uh, but of course, uh, we don't see the diversity of these kind of food crops anymore. Uh, in our supermarket, we see those very uh, homogenized form of, of, of bananas because they can be packaged into a box and be shipped easily could be could could be part of the supply chain. Uh, so in order to be quant mass produced uh, on a global scale, uh, the the variety of banana has to be decimated in order to find a variety that could grow into these boxes. And I see scholarly publications as being under the same kind of 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 production regimes. We are being asked to put our stuff into boxes that we're called journal, and they have to fit a certain standards set up by the publishers, or in this case of food producers. To me, they are very similar in terms of how they operate. And what we have seen over time globally is that a smaller number of producers are dominating more and more of the market. And one of the consequences when we look at food production is that, of course, a handful of of varieties of wheat and, and, and grains are now five different grains, rice, wheat, and, uh, and so forth, and maize, uh, dominate 90% of the global food market uh, today. And I see the same trend happening with scholarly production, that a small number of companies are producing highly homogenized scholarly output uh, as part of their supply chains to maximize their profit. Uh, along the supply chain. Now, this is actually a rejoinder to what Professor Balaram referred to earlier about the 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 kind of shameful uh, uh, shameful um, practices of maximizing profit. Uh, so you hear what you have here is a graph showing some of the most uh, brand name and uh, well-known journals, Nature, Cell, uh, Science, Lancet, and so forth how they have been spinning out uh, 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 what they call mirror journals or, or, or sister journals or offspring journals to capture the brand name. So you have nature reviews, you have nature genetics, you have nature this, nature that. And over the last uh, 20 years, they have created over 30 of them, uh, these different uh, branded journals. And they're, they, of course, because of their brand, because of their supposedly higher uh, prestige uh, and imply impact factor, uh, the, 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 the well-to-do uh, researchers and institution flock to these uh, branded journals to increase their own visibility. Now, what's interesting is that last year, uh, at the height of the pandemic, of course, in the US, uh, uh, there were a lot of soul searching uh, given the uh, the kind of racist uh, 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 uprising that were happening in the in 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 uh, in the country, and particularly after the murder of George Floyd by a policeman uh, in the U.S., and so across society and including the academia, there were a lot of of tough questions being asked about how we are complicit in a system that is systemically racist. Uh, and how systemic racism manifests differently uh, in different institutions and different practices. Uh, what was interesting was that Nature uh, put out this editorial uh, admitting that Nature as an organization is one of the white institutions that is responsible for bias in research and scholarship, and that the enterprise of science have been and remains complicit in systemic racism and it must try harder to correct those injustices and amplify marginalized voices. Okay, good for science uh, in making this statement, but in effect, what have they done? And they haven't done really much as you see. Uh, I was also uh, very interested in uh, the history of this journal, this, this very well-known institution. Nature goes back to uh, 1869. Uh, and uh, in this book, uh, this, this document the history of this journal. What was interesting, one fact is that uh, over this long history of this journal since 1869, there was only seven 
male editors in chief. They all serve long, long uh, tenure. Uh, it's only in the last three years or so where we see a co-editor in chief who is a woman. Um, one one particular passage stood out to me in the book. There are lots of of them, but this one uh, from uh, from one of the editor in chief, uh, John Maddox, that uh, reacted to uh, uh, a news story about uh, uh, you know nature's coverage of certain controversial topic, and. Maddox says that there is a powerful school of thought to think that uh, uh, really represented by other editors of journals, which holds that scientific literature is and should be a passive means of communication, a mirror held up to the face of research in which people other than his authors can discover what is happening in laboratories the world over. So, uh, this, he said, however, is an idealization which is far from the truth. In other words, it is a myth that journals are simply uh, passive recorders of scientific record, that they that they only report what's been published or, or, or being uh, uh, conducted by others. What Maddox is saying is that journals, powerful institutions like Nature, actually shape what constitutes science. And if you read the book, you'll get lots of uh, 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 different uh, take on this. Uh, journals like Nature and any of more, most of the Western journals shape the nature of science and discourse. What is constitute legitimate knowledge in those fields? Uh, and editors serves as the gatekeeper to enforces those boundaries. And so uh, these boundaries, of course, are very hard to cross. You have to be socialized into these institutions. You become one of them in order to get published and be successful. So it's not simply just the money you have to pay, but you have to be uh, willing to to fit into the system that is being defined by these very powerful entities. Uh, now, nature is not only powerful in defining what science and what legitimate knowledge is, uh, as, as we've been looking at how they've been very also greedy, to put it very mildly, in spinning out journals, and they even have this pyramid scheme of uh, charging uh, authors. So the top one, the nature, of course, is that the top of the food chain uh, charges uh, the most and have the highest rejection rate. And if you go down this, this pyramid, the scientific report has a lowest rejection rate, and therefore it will charge you also the less. So they're actually pegging their cost to uh, the prestige of these journals, which then would, would rise and fall with the journal impact factor. Uh, and so your fortune will depends on the marketplace, so to speak. And of course, as, as Heather and as Professor Bellaram pointed out, these are really systemic co uh, corrupting influence, but this systemic problem goes way back. This is not new. This kind of, uh, this kind of discriminatory structure is two and a half centuries in the making. Uh, this kind of hierarchicalization of who get published, whose knowledge counts, and so forth, is systemic in this sense. Uh, and, and racism uh, doesn't have to be about just a uh, very overt act of, of discrimination. Uh, racism is very much about institutional practice that privilege certain way of knowing over others. Right? And Vandana Shiva, of course, many of you in India knows her, uh, talks about this notion of the monoculture of the mind. And the monoculture of the mind is really what a lot of uh, journals uh, uh, per perpetuate. And this monoculture of the mind treats diversity as disease and creates coercive structures to remodel this biologically and culturally diverse world of ours on the concepts of one privileged class one race and one gender of a single species. So there are these standards that are then encoded into the journals. And in order for you to publish in these journals, you need to uh, socialize yourself into this singular standards that are often invisible. Uh, recently, we have the good fortune of putting together a podcast series, actually in partnership with Spark, uh, the organizations that uh, Heather oversees. Uh, and we, we invited a number of indigenous knowledge holders and scholars from different parts of the world 
to share the thought about their epistemologies and how they see their world in relations uh, to uh, to Western science. Uh, and uh, without, uh, well, there's lots of different uh, 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 ideas, of course, but one of the things that constantly came up was the relationship of ourselves with the land. That is, uh, in Western science, we treat the land as, as something we dominate over, something we study, something we then alter, so we can shape. Whereas, whereas all these indigenous knowledge holders reminded us land is what we are dependent on. Without land, uh, we're nothing. And so it is not we that should be shaping the land. We should be listening to the land, to learn from the land in order to, uh, in order to really exist well, live well uh, into the future. But of course, well, we have done the exact opposite, right? Uh, I want to take a particular quote from uh, from Professor Meyer, who's an indigenous scholar from Hawaii. And when she said that when you gather people like us together, meaning the indigenous scholars, we recognize difference and we honor difference because difference is what we have in common. But we go deep when we go deep into difference. I have found the depth of what it means to be universal. I believe Western systems confuse universal universality with uniformity. And this is why our specific epistemology found in our own Hawaiian culture is now called holographic epistemology. It must include everyone and everyone's thinking is all when you prioritize it with a value system that prioritizes love of land and service to people. And so uh, I'm come back to the conclusion and, and why I named the talk opening signs from below. Uh, and that is we need to begin with the land and land is not that is I'm not saying land is from below. It's just below referring to uh, the communities, the people who live on the land itself. That's that's the grassroots. That's where we need to begin when we think about science, when we think about policies. And if we ignore the majority of the people who are, are marginalized, who are underrepresented, the whole structures would not be sustainable. Uh, and that again, peoples are the key of our investment and we don't think enough about investing in people. So I end here and again, thank you Arun for your friendship, for your teaching uh, and uh, for your constant tireless uh, advocacy despite all the barriers. So again, thank you very much Arun and everybody who organized this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very insightful uh, you know, talk on uh, perfectly you you perfectly blended the issues that uh, you know the systemic issues that are plaguing the open science movement and also spoke about uh, several important issues including uh, racism and science colonization as well. Uh, thank you so much Professor Chang. Um, just to let the participants know that uh, for details and more such lectures uh, on uh, open science and the previous lectures uh, uh, that were organized during the past open science movement, you could visit the DST CPR website uh, whose uh, web link is pasted in the chat box. Uh, and now it's time to listen to the star of the evening, Professor Subaya Arunachalam himself. We are all very eager to hear from you on this occasion. Over to you, Professor Arunachalam. Thank you very much. Uh, I have been listening to the three talks with great care. And uh, Professor Balram, uh, in his usual style, uh, spoke about uh, his friendship with me for a long time. And uh, uh, he spoke about scientometrics, he spoke about open access, and he spoke about the uh, inequity uh, uh, because of the publishing systems and so on. And uh, as usual, he was uh, very incisive in his analysis. He gave a lot of data and he um, presented a number of... Uh, a number of uh, uh, instances from the past. 
Ms. Heather Joseph spoke about um, two key things, equity and social justice, both of which are very close to my heart. Uh, in fact, uh, in a recent uh, letter, uh, my friend Stephen Harnard spoke about these things. And uh, he told that my own interest in open access is driven more by humanitarian concerns, hunger, disease, and poverty alleviation than any scientific concerns. These three things I owe to Professor Swaminathan, my association with him for 12 years as a volunteer in his foundation in Chennai, where I worked closely with him and with the more, more so with the communities in Pondicherry and other places. And Harnard continues, surprisingly, hardly anyone in the LAS community in India seems to know of his long-term interest in rural development or his concerns for social justice and equitable order. So when Heather Joseph said equity and social justice, it resonated with me very, very well. And my longtime friend, uh, Leslie Chan, actually, although he comes from Canada, he is like us all. Uh, is one of those third worlders living in Canada. And uh, he also works in a department where they do a lot of development, social justice, humanities, that kind of work. And uh, I have published three or four papers with him, along with a lady called Barbara Kishap, who has also visited India several times. Uh, one good thing is, like Leslie told, I, I seem to know a lot of people and I seem to know them so well that whenever I call them, they're willing to come. Uh, and we had a fantastic meeting in Bangalore at the faculty hall of the Institute of Science, where apart from many people from India, we had 15 or 16 overseas participants, including five from China. The idea was to spread open access, the message of open access uh, in Latin America, India, and China, with the hope that if we spread this idea in these three regions, uh, in Latin America, mainly we concentrated on Brazil, we thought the idea will pick up elsewhere as well. So we invited five people from China, we invited uh, Abel Packer from Brazil and a few others from Latin America and a number of people from India. And we also had experts from around the world, including Alma Swan and Barbara Kirsa and several others. That meeting was a roaring success. We came up with what was called the Bangalore Declaration. And um, the declaration was largely drafted by Alma Swan and Barbara Kirsap. Later on, we also invited Barbara Kirsap and Leslie Chan several times to India, and also another person called Leslie Carr from Southampton, a close associate of uh, uh, Stephen Harnard. And uh, they came here to conduct a workshop. I remember uh, they were put up in a hotel uh, some three or four kilometers from my foundation. And uh, during an evening, Leslie Carr found there was a bug in the program. We virtually sat through the night to sort it out and uh, came fresh in the morning to conduct the program so well. I was very happy at the time because we had invited so many people including D.K. Sahu, 
um, uh, about whom Leslie Chan mentioned. And Chan was another great friend of mine. And there was a conference in somewhere in the Netherlands. I do not remember. Uh, it's a small town in the Netherlands, not Amsterdam or Leiden or some big city, but a small town. So I was invited. And then I told the organizers, I would like to bring a friend. And then the organizers are ready to uh, finance this uh, travel as well. Uh, and we went together. And uh, he saw who presented his material there, and everybody appreciated his work. Um, on another occasion uh, in Europe again, uh, this time it was Amsterdam. I was invited for a conference, and I wanted Madan, who was working closely with me at the time, to uh, go with me. Uh, but uh, we didn't want to ask the organizers for money. So I asked another foundation with whom I was working, namely the Center for Internet and Society, would they be able to support Madan's travel and hotel expenses? They agreed. So I took Madan along with me. So we went to that meeting and we learned a lot from whatever was happening there and came enlightened, returned to India more enlightened. So we had such experiences uh, throughout my life. And um, uh, as uh, Leslie pointed out, uh, and as Abhi tells me all the time, that I seem to know a lot of people. And um, uh, he, in fact, he used to ask me, how did, how did it happen? How did it happen? How did you come to know all these people? And I don't know. I, I just know them. That's it. So, uh, and whenever I went to places, so I used to make it a point not to go for sightseeing or shopping, but to meet people. So once I was uh, uh, in Washington, DC, actually I had gone um, to speak at the memorial meeting for Dr. Garfield in Philadelphia. But I, was, I went some 20 days in advance. I stayed with a relative in Washington, DC. And uh, then not, not Washington, DC proper, but close to Washington, DC in a suburb. So one day I found out the way to go by the Metro to Washington, DC, uh, to do the DuPont Circle and uh, located the office of um, Heather Joseph. And uh, went there to meet her. She was not there on the day. Nick was there. And the next day I went and she was there and I went, had lunch with her. And uh, um, I, that was the first time I met her. Uh, instantly, we became good friends, and uh, this happened with so many people. And to tell you about my foray into open access, I can't know about open access uh, from Stephen Harnard, like one of those. Um, uh, I have not met him before. I have not read any of his articles at that time, but I saw a mention of his a famous iconic paper on scholarly skywriting in one of Garfield's editorials. Uh, although the original article of Garfield, uh, uh, Harnard was written several years before that. Uh, then I knew about Harnard and I met him in Brazil uh, in, a, in some other meeting. So by that I had invited him and my other friend, Alan Gilchrist, editor of Journal of Information Science, to come to India. And uh, Harnard was a little cut up with me. So he had been writing to me about a meeting. But when is the meeting happening? Uh, no information about the meeting. I said, no, I, I don't have the money. I have invited you, but I have not yet gathered the funds for inviting you. So please wait. Things in India happened rather slowly. So OK, he was a little annoyed with me at that time. But then when he landed in India, he knew uh, that everything here is fine. And uh, I took Alan Gilchrist and uh, Stephen Harnard on a trip to Mysore. At that time, there was some strike going on in Mysore. We, we had abandoned the trip halfway and we had returned. Actually, we were using 
a car uh, provided to us by Satya, uh, who owned a company, who owns a company called Informatics India, and he was kind enough to uh, lend his car. And uh, we went there. So uh, several people came to India in the area of information, uh, in the area of scientometrics, in the area of open access and so on. And uh, uh, I'm happy that I was instrumental in bringing them all here and uh, sharing the benefit with others. But a number of people in India, uh, especially among the librarians and information professionals, uh, know me uh, as someone dabbling in scientometrics or open access. But the most important thing in my own opinion that I have done is neither of these two things. Is what Leslie pointed out and what Heather mentioned, namely equity, social justice, uh, rural development, and so on. So, uh, in fact, my friend Madan uh, often points out, uh, how come you're writing about social justice? Uh, and Balram pointed about my quoting Chairman Mao, especially in India at that time, quoting Chairman Mao would be anathema. So uh, somehow I was interested in those things and uh, I was not worried about consequences. So I was a free man. So luckily the family into which I was born uh, gave me the freedom to be a free man. So I, I did several things uh, which normally uh, people working for the government would not have done. Uh, I did those things at that time. So I should say my life has been fully satisfying to me and I can look back with uh, some pride that uh, uh, I have lived a decent life, although I might not have achieved much. So coming back to open access, we have a very long way to go. Uh, unfortunately, in India, we are talking about uh, own nation, own subscription, uh, or uh, 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 there is somebody plan, yes, and things like that. I don't think these things should work in India or in any developing country or poss possibly in anywhere in the world. But I do not know uh, the powers that be in India uh, don't seem to understand these things. Um, and uh, they will learn eventually, but it will take a long time. But that's one reason why people like us should keep at it and um, forcefully argue against these things and get to the right path. And I'm happy that my colleagues at the Center for Policy Research at uh, Institute of Science uh, thought fit to uh, kind of uh, celebrate this year's Open Access Week along with a kind of uh, giving me a uh, tribute for on my 80th uh, birthday. I must uh, thank uh, Abhi and the rest of my colleagues for that. And I must also thank the Institute of Science for letting us have that center, first of all, in their premises, in their institution. So, and I thank uh, Heather and uh, Leslie for coming all the way for this talk. And of course, my old friend Balram uh, uh, for taking off time to speak on this occasion. And all of you who attended this online meeting. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Professor Arna Chalam and the eminent Palan for the insightful discourse today. Uh, but I think without some question answer, we can't end it. So uh, I would like to now uh, open the floor for a short question and answer session, but it's already quite late in India, so we will keep it brief. Uh, you can use that hand raised signal icon, look at it, and uh, ask your question. Or if you want to type it in the chat box, then please do so. I will read it out. 
So depending on the hand run signal, I will uh, call the names. So please uh, go ahead. Just... Okay, so... Hello. Uh, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Yes, please go ahead. My name is uh, Baskaran. I'm a 50 year old friend of, I mean, I have been a friends with Arunachalam for nearly 51 years. I just wanted to describe Arunachalam as a catalyst. He has played important role in the likes of several people I know by being a catalyst in connecting them to great people and enjoying the progress that they make. So Leslie Chan said that, you know, he's a great uh, human being and makes connections. It's very true. Much, much more than open access, Arunachalam creates access to human beings to you know, many, many there are many, many stories. I mean, I have no time. I just wanted to wish him all the best on his 80th birthday. And we are old friends. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam, can I just speak for a minute, please? Yes, uh, this please. is Professor Lakshman Rao from Hyderabad. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, Professor Subhai Arna Chalamgaru. Uh, he is working on uh, open access for a long time, and we all learned a lot of things from him. And especially this session has helped me to learn the latest things that are happening in the open access. But uh, as uh, Professor Subhai Arnachalam raised the ONOS, I also feel that it is not possible in this uh, country because of the big country. But however, uh, I, I feel there is no relationship actually between OA and OA, uh, ONOS. Could uh, Subhai Arnachalam Garu give some uh, hint about uh, relationship between these two and what will be the future of ONOS? You mean one nation, one subscription? <laughs> Do sir. You? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the idea is, instead of each institution subscribing and paying a lot of money to publishers, uh, some agency, probably a government agency, will pay for a huge sum. Uh, it won't be the sum of all the subscriptions, but a small part of it, and make it available to everybody online. This is the but idea. Is it possible in India, sir? That is what my question. No, no, I am telling you, uh, no, no, I am uh, absolutely uh, against such an idea. Uh, uh, the idea is to throw away money to commercial publishers. We should give the commercial publishers a hand. Uh, the One Nation One subscription will give a lot of money to commercial publishers. The idea is not to give them the money. If it, there are other methods by which all this knowledge can be made available, like the physicists have already been doing through the archives. There are so many other ways of doing. So that's the idea. So are, is there any question that uh, anyone would like to ask on the issues to our speaker? Uh, uh, I, looks... I would like to. I'd like to ask a question, uh, if you may permit me. Yes, please, please, please go Professor ahead. Professor Arun, uh, it's been a wonderful honor to be at this uh, event. Uh, this is Shadi, and uh, thanks to IASC for uh, organizing this wonderful event. Um, my question to Professor Arun is, uh, you know, he mentioned that he hasn't achieved much, uh, although he has. He has been very modest, but. Um, you know, what is he likely to do in the next phase of his life? Now that he has completed 80 years, uh, he has uh, many more years to go. Uh, where would the focus be, Professor Arun? Thank you. Uh, Professor Arunachalam, uh, do you hear the question? I mean, Shadi didn't make any, didn't ask any question. He was just wishing me well for the rest of my life. So he was even also asking now what you will do, what next? Okay. No, I, I never plan for anything. Things come along and I, I just plunge in. That's the way I do. So, 
So you may enlighten us like what is the next if you already have figured it out. OK, the next is I haven't been traveling for the past few years uh, because of the minor health issues. But now I want to resume my activities. I want to come to our center and spend at least a couple of weeks uh, in the beginning. And if it works out, I'll resume coming every month. That's what I want to do. And uh, carry on with my work on scientometrics, open access, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately, we are not doing much work on development research there, uh, but maybe we should start some. Oh, sure. Um, like, Thanks. Uh, like Leslie had connected, uh, is interest in open access and development work. I mean, I was so amazed. I didn't know about uh, the work that he does with indigenous communities uh, in Hawaii and other places. And uh, maybe I should uh, sit with him on day and learn. Yeah, and also actually uh, in uh, some time we will invite, uh, this is uh, Dr. Rajesh Tandon of Priya as well, who is a co-author of uh, Professor Chen. So maybe you will get to meet him there as well on the same type of work. Uh, I think there is one more hand raise. Uh, so it's Bivut. The gain, but if I missed. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, this is Vibodh Parthasarthi from Jamia Milia in Delhi. Uh, Arun and I shared some board positions together, and I think this is a really great uh, evening to sort of not just felicitate him, but around these three wonderful talks here. Uh, my question, of course, and any of the panelists could address this, is that somehow the uh, the open access uh, sort of publications discussions always tend to end up big discussions about publications in the sciences there. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering, are there any impediments to extend this, uh, this entire practice or sensibility towards the social sciences here? Yeah. I mean, why isn't, why, why isn't, why don't we see such a buzz on open access in the social sciences here? Yeah. I'm a social scientist, but that's why I guess I, I'm posing this question here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Arunachalam, we will take this question. No, Leslie is a social scientist. Leslie is a social scientist and he has been doing quite a bit of it in the field. So, Leslie, please. Yeah, um, yeah, I would say that a lot of the innovation actually came from the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, and if you look at platforms like Humanities Commons, uh, it's uh, common infrastructures built for and by scholars in the humanities and then you have the open libraries of humanities great models of uh, supporting journals by library subscription so to answer the question about subscription re-diverting our money from the library why not if libraries are willing to spend money it's just that why give it to the commercial publisher give it to the scholarly publishers to help them build open access and then beautiful model about the open library of, of humanities model is that they only need X number of library to subscribe to underwrite the cost of production. And then the rest of the world get open access to that same content, right? So those who can pay, pay for everybody else, so to speak. And most library from the global north have lots of money to pay subscription. Why not pay it into a common pool rather than paying them to the publishers? So, so the social scientists and humanities have been very active in this space, I would say, yeah. And Heather is not even a scientist by training, if I'm right. And uh, she has been doing a wonderful job all through. She has run two major societies, the Astronomical Society Journals, the, she has done some Biological Society Journals, and now she is managing SPAR and without formal training in science. So, I mean, she should be able to answer your question now. I, I completely agree with Leslie that there has been a lot of progress um, in the open access movement driven from the social science and humanities community. I would say sometimes it doesn't get as much attention as life sciences and physical sciences does, um, mainly because the high uh, the, the most expensive journals tend to be in the physical and life sciences and the the the, the affordability issues tend to be um, not quite as a... 
it gets less attention than quite possibly it should, but there is a lot of, um, of activity. And in the slide that, that I talked about, the kinds of models that we want the community and we want to rally our community to support what Leslie described, um, collective cooperative models where pools of libraries and institutions uh, create um, uh, sort of at scale funds to be able to support models are ex the, the examples that he gave, the Open Library of Humanities, uh, the um, uh, Modern Language Association's uh, large platform as well. Those are exactly the kinds of things that I think are actually leading the way for how physical and life sciences can think about addressing and they have their roots in the social sciences and humanity. I also share a link in the chat box of uh, a Pan uh, Latin American initiative called Amelica. Again, hundreds of journals uh, banding together to provide open access collectively. And so I would encourage you, look, again, many of them supported by social science uh, um, councils uh, in Latin America. Yeah, actually last year's Open Access Week, we had uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Dominique Babini and uh, uh, and also, uh, I forget her name just now. It's just so we have this uh, uh, wonderful lecture by them, what they are doing. So anyone interested can go to our website and see last year's lecture. It is really interesting. And even we today had Professor Gudo with us as for some time as well. He gave another lecture last week during our Open Access Week. But now I think, yeah, Professor Abhinandan has a question. Uh, Abhi, please. Uh, yeah. So it's interesting that uh, the uh, Latin American efforts uh, have come up in the discussion. So my question is, uh, uh, what is it uh, that uh, uh, prevents that kind of efforts uh, from diffusing out into the rest of the world? Uh, if if uh, they have succeeded uh, in doing certain things the right way, at least according to the community uh, that is interested in open access, so uh, what is it that others can do to either replicate uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, efforts or, or even asking them to come and help us with uh, that sort of stuff? What is it that we need to do? Uh, is it the government or is it the uh, scientific community which, is, uh, uh, which needs to get involved in this activity? Your thoughts, uh, any of the panelists, yeah. Okay, both Leslie and John Wilinski of Stanford are working closely with the Latin Americans for a very long time. And uh, uh, Leslie started with BioLine and later on he moved into some advisory positions there. And uh, Wilinski started with his uh, uh, software, uh, which is being used by uh, Silo and other uh, journals in Latin America. And they know very well about the situation there. And uh, in fact, we invited the two specialists from Latin America last year with this idea of seeking their help uh, to help spread the message in India. Uh, but you and I asking them means nothing. The journal editors, uh, the funders, funders mean the government of India and so on. But the government of India seems to be more uh, thinking in terms of uh, plan, yes, and one nation, one subscription, and not in terms of outrun proper journals, you see. That's the problem here. So the problem is not with uh, how to get them, but how to convince our own uh, agencies here to go in the right direction. Yeah, so if I may jump in, uh, I think it goes back to Professor Balaram's diagnosis of this addiction to prestige. Uh, and I think this is this bias against your own journals, your own local journals. If you publish in the New Delhi Journal of Medicine, it's not seen as prestigious as the New England Journal of Medicine, even though both of them are regional journals, but one is highly regarded and the other one isn't. So I think you have to change the mindset. That's part of my, my, my underlying themes about opening signs from below that you have to respect your own system. I think I think that's what the Latin American have done uh, that is strengthening their own and respecting their own system rather than, you know, 
putting their eggs in somebody else's uh, reputation basket. So I, I think that's the um, a change of mindset. Thank you. Uh, I see also some more hand raise. Uh, so again, uh, who wants to go first? I think uh, Satya Tarana, he has not, he wanted to ask something. Will you go ahead? Sapir, you are muted. You are muted now. Uh, you are still muted, Satya, please. Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, uh, yeah, now, yeah. now you can tell me. Am I able now? Yes. Yes, yes. Are. Okay. Uh, as an admirer of Arun for a long time, I wanted to greet him on this occasion of uh, very, you know, <clears throat> befittingly uh, felicitating him through this program. As Professor Balram said, uh, uh, Arun is really a tireless uh, crusader of uh, open access movement in India with global impact. And he has been an inspiration to us uh, to be open and bold. When I say open and bold, you know, I still remember uh, one of his earliest articles uh, on uh, uh, is Indian science mediocre, which created a lot of controversies. but. Uh, uh, the kind of uh, journalistic ethics he followed as a science journalist is something remarkable. And as uh, uh, Mr. Bhaskar said, you know, he has been catalyzing librarians, which is deep and uh, uh, kind of a natural flair for information science. And uh, Arun, uh, uh, <clears throat> we all really enjoy your uh, writing and speaking. And uh, my best wishes to you. And um, um, I agree, you know, I wish you a good health. And certainly we all look forward to you getting back more actively into, um, you know, encouraging people. And uh, talking about OA movement, uh, uh, which is something uh, I, I'm quite passionate about. Uh, uh, I think we are uh, now more than two decades with the OA movement. In terms of achievement, uh, a, you know, it has created a very strong and deep spread of uh, advocacy uh, all over the world. And uh, as a benefit, a significant part of currently published literature uh, is becoming, uh, you know, getting into OA within one to two years, almost about 55%, but a lot needs to be uh, done. But what is uh, disappointing is even after two decades, uh, we, we are still struggling to come out with a sustainable business model. Uh, I don't know when it will happen. Uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> my thoughts uh, go back to um, um, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, when I heard Leslie Chan mentioned uh, about Gandhi in a context. Uh, I think uh, uh, there is a big relevance of bringing Gandhi here, which I had mentioned on another occasion. When Gandhi returned from South Africa to India on his way, uh, he thought that uh, he must uh, find a way to communicate to people across the country about uh, the whole, the, the need for, uh, you know, about the freedom movement he was going to launch. He came with a good preparation. And the famous book he wrote in the ship is a book called Hind Swaraj in uh, Gujarati. And he also translated into the uh, English version, Indian Home Rules. Now, Gandhi as an author is a very good model for uh, the authors of the scientific world, you know, contributing mountains of paper. What Gandhi did in those days, somewhere in 1932 or something, when he published this book, he put a very nice statement. 
all rights unreserved you know it's just the opposite of what we see in all the books copyrighted all rights reserved now uh, if in a, uh, in the open access movement so far has very you know has been focusing a lot on publishers and uh, particularly the publishers great yes that's understandable but uh, i really wish that the movement focuses on uh, changing the minds of authors emboldening authors to follow what gandhi did uh, several years ago more than a century ago uh, will this happen uh, i strongly feel that the strategy of open access movement its time shifts from uh, uh, publishers to authors and making authors feel more responsible to make their content available and uh, uh, it is just an open thinking i thought of putting it across it's time we really take authors into confidence and come out with some business model that can really become sustainable uh, thank you Okay, uh, I think I see another hand hand raised from uh, Sada Shivan KP. If he wants to speak, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, sl I'm slightly deviating from the uh, professional uh, open access open source discussion. I was really enjoying the warmth of. Professor Arunachalam and uh, uh, Professor Leslie Chan together again in this forum. I recollect the great days when they together came down to Trivandrum and we had a fantastic two or three days here uh, giving uh, two or three lectures in uh, Triple ITMB Trivandrum, in the CSIR Laboratory Trivandrum, and in the Kerala University. And uh, uh, my humble wish to Professor Arunachalam is that uh, he has to continue. Uh, enlightening us, connecting professionals, and consolidating, consolidating his great memories. Uh, 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 I had the privilege of enjoying uh, a, a great amount of memories uh, in different occasions when we were together uh, in some program or the other. So I wish him a great days ahead, and uh, uh, we hope we all will be enriched by his wisdom. in the years to come thank you uh, that's wonderful uh, but there is only one hand raised from mr vaskar and i think that it could be the last one because it's already quite late uh, so uh, vaskar Uh, do, you, do you hear me? I'm not sure I heard you. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the question that I want to ask uh, of every everybody here, uh, including the speakers and the audience, is that you know there is a certain nobility to open access and open source and open science. Uh, but as soon as the nobility puts out a first version of it a commercial interest is able to completely take it over and make it its own okay so how the science function in a way the commercial interest cannot actually make it its own i mean uh, in in today's talks i've given Uh, uh, Leslie Chang, uh, a professor, has given hundreds of examples of that, and we all have lived through uh, those examples. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, in in our lives, uh, even even as a poor man, or as a rich man, or as a privileged uh, uh, researcher, or as a poor farmer, we've all lived through the crisis of knowledge and knowledge sharing. Okay, how do you make sure that we can? arrive at the policy on the platform that is also nationalistic that today demands 
every country demands that it be nationalistic okay and how do we actually come to an implementation strategy not a philosophical um, conundrum but an implementation implementation strategy that ensures that private commercial operators do not take that strategy and completely run away with it okay many examples of which have been cited in all of these talks uh, in today's session itself thank you so much for even allowing me to ask this question okay uh please any of the speakers or professor arun anyone please uh, uh professor chat would you like to take this question now yeah um again i think it's is is has a lot to do with mindset right and so uh if you again speak to uh some of my indigenous colleague uh they will remind us that uh you know the notion of property is a fairly recent human invention especially intellectual property right who sh who owns the air that we breathe and who owns the trees that is in the forest I think we we have somehow allow a system to define ownership that are completely arbitrary and fictitious. And I think is is a is a really cultural shift that we have to say, well, you know, as a society, not just for the scholars themselves about their their output, but as a society, should we, you know, make sure that these common goods are there for the people and that the government's role is to make sure those common goods are available to everybody not those who have the 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 financial resources to to get them so so it's not a it's not a just a question about scholar, open access to scholarship it's about the kind of society that we want to see ourselves living in right um so it's a broader 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 framing, I would think. So if we get more people involved in this discussion, I think we'll be better off, not just the academics themselves. Uh, okay, I think uh, I mean, there are more hand raised coming. So uh, Ratnakar, uh, sir, will you take the last question, maybe this one? Uh, you are on mute, sir. Uh, Ratnakar, uh, you're on mute. Dr. Ratnakar. Dr. Ratnakar. You're on mute. Dr. Ratnakar, you are on mute. Yeah, now it's on oh, mute. Now. No, again mute. I think something wrong going wrong. No, no, you are, now we can hear you. Now we okay. can hear you. Uh, my association with uh, Arun is for over 50 years when I was a student at what was then known as INSDOC. And since then, we have been closely associated with many things. I was just, I am still, uh, when I retired, uh, just a librarian at the Raman Research Institute, Bangalore. And Arun moved from Delhi for a few years to, to Indian Academy of Sciences when our uh, friendship became more uh, close. And we have worked on many projects. I was not a uh, great scientist or something, nor a great information scientist, but my thing was to provide information to people, science, scientists who were working at the Raman Research Institute which spread across later on to other places. Arun and I met many a times on many issues and have discussed things which have not been published anywhere. The greatness of Arun is that he doesn't talk about his own work much, but others are allowed to talk about it. His zeal and his intention of bringing open access to India is known across the world. And it was great that he brought people like Eugene and others to India. And through them, I had a chance to meet more, all of them. 
uh, way back when I was working at Raman Institute. And Arun is an example for those who think that they do not have much to give, but he shows them a way how they can contribute to the society. It's not necessary that you must be a great scientist or great uh, philosopher, but all that is required is your intention to help others and do your best for them. I wish Arun all the best and we've been in close touch even now. And uh, I only hope that Arun lives a healthier life. I know how he is, not many people know it. In spite of that, his zeal for open access is admirable. Okay, Arun, it is so great that people in Bangalore had a chance to uh, talk to you and share their views with you. And people like Leslie and others came here. And I wish all the best to you in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thakar. It's, it's wonderful. I think it's now time to end this session because it's already late. So I will ask my co-moderator, Dr. Janice, to say the final thank you note. Thank you, Mamita, and uh, thank you, everyone. It's indeed uh, not just a learning experience, but also uh, very touching to see how uh, all the associates and friends of uh, Professor Arunachalam are here this evening. Uh, and like we say, all good things come to an end, and it's time to draw curtains on today's open access discussion. I'm extremely grateful to our uh, uh, resourceful panelists, Professor uh, Balram, uh, Heather Joseph, and Professor Leslie Chan for their excellent presentations and thought-provoking take on open access. And of course, the icing on the cake were the thoughts of Professor Arunachalam. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Abhinandan, who is the coordinator of the Center for Policy Research at IISC, for his guidance and encouragement. Thanks to our Open Access uh, Week team members, especially Mr. Madan Muttu and Mr. Gunashekaran, who are longtime associates of Professor Arunachalam. I would also like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Anand Bhairappa and Dr. Francis Jaikant from ISC Library for their support. Finally, I would like to conclude this session by thanking uh, all of you, you know, highly participatory audience for making this session worth every minute. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening and a wonderful weekend ahead. If I could request uh, Madan and Gunasekaran to please switch on their webcam so that we could have a photograph with uh, Professor Arunachalam as well. <laughs> hmm. Where is Guna? I see. Uh, oh, he does I not have chat. Okay. <laughs> I have some internet okay. problems. Uh, I think. Uh, sure. Okay. All right. No problems. Okay, so yes, so here's the photograph, please smile. <laughs> yeah. Satya? Yeah, if we can have some more friends of Professor Arunachalam here also, we could have a few photographs too. Yeah, Satya? Okay. So I guess now it's time to end open because it's already late and Professor Arunachalam, I guess it's maybe time for you to have your dinner. Oh, I had my dinner at 6.30. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a Jane. <laughs> Before sunset. Okay, so Excellent. then you yeah, can. Thank you all. Thank you all so thank much. You all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Great event. Uh, and uh, Arun, waiting for you in Canada, okay? We're waiting for you to sure. visit. Sure. When I'm able to fly, I'll do. I'll, I'll come. Yeah. But, but, but yeah. Bangalore before that. Bangalore. <laughs> Bangalore is the first step. Bangalore might be the last to go. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> last to go. Oh.
Okay. She's all eating right. on. Eating on all the time. Okay. So I guess I will end the meeting now here. Okay. So yeah. Thanks, please. everyone. Bye -bye. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Good thank you. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.